Hi everyone, this is Kelsey Jones. I'm uh, executive editor of Search Engine Journal and I'm here today with SEJ founder Lauren Baker and he's going to talk about dynamic uh, SERP ranking with Google. Um, if you want to follow along and live tweet with us, our hashtag is SEJ Think Tank. And if you have any audio issues, uh, you can also dial in with your phone. The phone number should be in your registration email. So with that, uh, Lauren, please take it away. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for making this webinar today. Um, this webinar is set up to really go over an understanding of how Google serves results, um, not only one set of results, but results based upon uh, various zip codes and uh, geographic locations. Um, the information in this webinar is going to be incredibly useful for if you are, are a brick and mortar, say restaurant, university, uh, school, whatever it may be, um, franchise, e, and also if you're also a, um, a company that uh, competes solely on the web. So. Uh, "Quote unquote virtual company, so to speak. I'll go over multiple examples, um, but uh, let me first introduce myself. Like Kelsey said, my name is Lauren Baker. I'm the founder of SEJ. I'm also a co-founder of Foundation Digital, a digital marketing boutique. So again, what I'm going to go over today is basically how Google works right now and the way it serves results across multiple, um, not only locations, but also the dynamic factor of Google rankings, uh, which is the inclusion of uh, localization, um, the knowledge graph, things like that. So I'm going to go over that in um, pretty good detail. Also, how to track um, where you are ranking across multiple locations and uh, the competition within those locations to really build a competitive strategy um, for your overall uh, SEO um, initiative. Uh, we're going to go into some technical changes on the site. Also, building local signals, which uh, consists of links and social signals, and the content that you can put together to really uh, hit those local influencers and have them sharing information about you. And then afterwards, we're going to have 20 minutes for Q&A. So let's begin. Google rank tracking. So ever since the inception of SEO, like the ability to track where you rank in Google by keyword has, you know, it's really been the cornerstone. Traffic, of course, is incredibly important. But, um, you know, a lot of uh, companies still really rank their overall SEO success based upon where they're tracking for specific keywords of high search volumes. And a lot of the SEO tools out there um, only look at one data set of rankings, uh, which is commonly referred to as Google USA. Uh, but the fact is, is that Google results are personalized um, down to the local level and even the device someone is using. So, um, you know, if you search for a term like car insurance in Philadelphia and then you search for car insurance in Cleveland, you're going to get two different sets of results based upon um, local competition and also uh, the way that uh, sites that may be online only have optimized themselves to compete in those uh, local spaces. And uh, again, you know, one thing that I, I really want to um, hit here is that, you know, ranking numbers by themselves don't really mean much. If you report back to someone saying, hey, you rank number two, you rank number four, you rank number six, that's not really what we're looking at here. The true value of monitoring uh, SERPs is understanding who you're competing against in those SERPs and really refining down to what they're doing. Um, and, you know, Basically, Google USA is only accessible when someone uh, hits their goes to the browser in their search tools in Google and uh, uh, selects Google USA. Um, Google targets results down to um, where you're accessing and searching from and where you're standing on the mobile device. Now, before we get into localization, I want to go over some forms of uh, dynamic results, right? And a lot of this is in the knowledge graph. So the knowledge graph is basically when Google serves either scraped content that's relevant to the query or uh, content that's uh, based off of publicly accessible data uh, for the results. And Google serves that content, of course, above the organic results. And this is really a stickler when you're looking at ranking because you may rank number one or number three for a term, but the fact is is that you may see a drop in your, in your traffic when Google uh, places knowledge graph results or dynamic results above the, uh, the organic ranking. So you'll see here, uh, the first example to the left is, uh, you know, knowledge graph being a, a rich answer um, to a question. What is a knowledge graph? And then Google answers their own question. Um, ironically enough, they rank that above google.com. 
um, uh, weather-oriented results. So, hey, what's the weather? Um, you know, G Google is uh, serving this above uh, sites like weather.com, weatherbug, and weather underground, uh, which um, I'm expecting have seen all seen a drop in uh, organic traffic since uh, Google implemented uh, the weather version of the knowledge graph. Uh, also, you'll see uh, cinema show times. Uh, when you're searching for different terms and events. So Google is really in introducing this knowledge graph across the board, um, especially with, uh, with uh, news-oriented terms. So here's an example of the Google knowledge graph working in conjunction with the News One box. And what you'll really see here is that the knowledge graph is uh, placed on the right side of the uh, search results, and then uh, Google is pulling in um, top news stories for this relevant news-oriented query. In this case, it's Blake Griffin. Um, from the Los Angeles Clippers, but uh, you'll see that um, even though um, ESPN ranks number one for the query Blake Griffin, they're actually ranking number four be underneath all of these other uh, uh, sites that are pulled in uh, through Google News. Um, so again, things to really look out for, especially if, uh, if newsworthy topics are, are part of your overall strategy. Um, also, from a travel and local perspective, you'll see that uh, this search for a hotel brand name um, not only brings in, uh, in this case, the hotel is ranking number one, but also, uh, you know, rich information from snippets and reviews, um, the ability to call, uh, maps, everything else. So it's really changing the dynamics. No longer are we looking at a, um, a list of the top ten links. Uh, so um, first we're going to start with a poll before we get going. Okay, great. So I'm going to send out the poll. The question is, which of your rankings do you track? Possible answers are, I only track one set of rankings. I track various sets based on location, and I don't track rankings at all and use Google Webmaster Tools. So I'm launching that on your screen now. You just have a couple seconds to answer. If everyone could answer, that'd be great. And uh, while we're waiting for those results, I just want to remind everybody that the presentation slides will be available on SlideShare, and then the entire presentation will also be available on YouTube, minus uh, Lauren's beautiful face on video. Um, that, that will happen a little bit later this week or earlier next week. So it looks like we have a pretty good percentage uh, coming in, so I'm going to close the poll results right now. And if you see the results here, it's pretty much deadlocked. Uh, the majority said they just use Google Webmaster Tools. Um, and then the next most popular answer was you tracked various sets based on location. So Lauren, back Very to cool. you. Very cool. That's great information to know while running through this. Okay, so Google loves localized SERPs. And like I said before, it doesn't matter if you're a brick and mortar like a restaurant or a hotel, or if you're running a website like an Airbnb where it's purely virtual, a virtual marketplace, uh, Google is going to serve different results in different areas. And what that really means is that, you know, um, people are just seeing, uh, you really have different competitors in, in every market. So. Here's an example. Like you might expect uh, localized results for a term like Chinese restaurants. And a great way to uh, set this manually, if you're not currently using a tool that has localized results, is to go into your uh, search tools when making a query, uh, select a location, and select and look at different cities. So you can type them in right here. Um, so to your right are some uh, different results when uh, I searched for the term dating while in the LA area. And what you'll see is Wikipedia ranks number one. Number two and number three are Match.com and OkCupid, but it's not their home page, it's their local page, right? They don't have really a local presence whatsoever. They don't have a brick and mortar, so we're not necessarily talking about Google Local here. We're talking about Google's algorithm finding the most relevant pages to people that live in that area and serving it. So you'll see here Match.com, Los Angeles, OkCupid, okay, Los Angeles. And the fourth example is a great example, too, of a content strategy that's working for BuzzFeed.com. So they've done a post, 27 Symptoms of Dating in LA, and that ranks number four for the term dating in Los Angeles. So Google's not only serving business pages, but they're also serving content pages. And this is really something to keep in mind, not only when planning the infrastructure of your site, but your overall content strategy as well. Here are some other examples comparing Los Angeles and Fort Worth, Texas for the term meet people. As you'll see, um, meetup.com only ranks number four in the LA market for the term meet people. Um, 
L Google is preferring uh, different blogs in, in, in the LA market and a directory of uh, Yelp in the LA market as well. Um, whereas in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, Meetup ranks number one. Um, so if I'm competing with Meetup or I am Meetup, I'm really looking at these results to see how I can raise um, my ranking in LA. And what I'm getting from this really is that you know perhaps Meetup might want to do a blog post about that because uh, Google is really preferring blog posts and content in the LA market. Uh, same thing with Mexican restaurants. So you'll see here two different sets of results, uh, same geographic comparison. Um, in LA, it's all directories when you search the, for the term Mexican restaurant. Singular, not plural. Um, and then in Fort Worth, it's actually serving restaurant pages. So, you know, uh, again, for your marketing plan in LA, you might want to get listed in a lot of these directories because that's what people are finding when they search for Mexican restaurant in Google. In Fort Worth, you have the ability to actually rank your site for that term. So, different locations, different strategies. All right, so based upon the poll, only 34% of you are tracking your, uh, your ranking sets based upon location. And um, for the rest of you, I wanted to introduce uh, three tools. Um, they're all paid tools, by the way. Not too many free tools are, are doing this or even track rankings uh, quite well. Um, SEM Rush, Search Metrics, and Authority Labs. They're all very different tools. SEM Rush is more so made for the site owner or the uh, medium sized business. Uh, Search Metrics is an enterprise solution for larger websites or, or for companies that, that, like hotels, that do have locations in, in multiple cities. And Authority Labs is kind of a mix of both and also has an API that serves both uh, local and mobile uh, device rankings. And typically, the way that you would set this up in a, a search tool um, is by you know, setting up your domain like you traditionally do. But in the SCM Rush example, they give you the ability to uh, choose a location by uh, country, region, and city, and only pull the ranking and SERPs for, those, for that city. So you really have to set this up city by city. And then look at the differentiation here, like across each of those cities. So this, in this example, this school is uh, seeing a uh, different competitor set and different rankings in every city uh, that, they, that they have a location. Um, also, one thing I wanted to point out, too, is that some tools have the ability to search by desktop or by mobile. And, you know, mobile friendliness is becoming more and more important, and uh, all signs point to Google really altering the way that they they serve uh, mobile results based upon mobile site friendliness. So I would, I would uh, recommend, uh, if you have the ability to do so through a tool set, tracking mobile rankings as well. Um, and like I said previously, one of the things I really enjoy about uh, looking at uh, ranking reports or SERP reports per se is really getting a feel of the competitive landscape. So in the example to the left is for a search on vocational nurse programs in San Antonio um, that we pulled for one specific site. We see that the site that we pulled it for is ranking number one. But then underneath, um, and the site that we pulled it for is a national company, but underneath it are all local schools in the San Antonio area. So luckily, well not luck, but um, they are outranking the local schools in the area, but those schools are pushing up, and I'm sure that those schools have all kinds of local signals that you can pull. Um, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later from a competitive analysis perspective. And then um, here's an example with search metrics. So what I like about search metrics is in this graph, they look at the keyword uh, history uh, for Google San Francisco, Google Dallas, and then compare that against Google USA. So you can see fluctuation for your search results, and in this case, uh, rental car. Um, uh, across a timeline and, and really sync that up with, with happenings. Um, you know, uh, a lot of data and studies have pointed to um, uh, fluctuations in SERPs based upon outdoor advertising because people are typing in the name of your, of your company um, and their mobile and Google will actually raise your, it, when Google sees that behavior, they may raise your site for uh, non-branded terms as well. So let's get on to the second poll question. Okay, great. Um, so our second poll question is, does your SEO rank tracking tool that you use track local SERPs? So yes, no, or I don't know. So I'm going to launch that now. And uh, while we're waiting, I just wanted to give a quick uh, disclosure. Search Metrics is a partner of ours for our upcoming SEJ Summit series of events. Um, if you're interested in attending one of those events, which are free, and there's going to be seven of them throughout the year, Danielle is going to post the two links first to our upcoming summit, which is next Tuesday, 
um, in the LA area. And then she's also going to post the landing page for all our summits if you guys are interested. Chicago, Dallas, New York, Miami, etc. So just a couple more seconds for the poll. Okay, I'm going to close it now. And it looks like 37% of you said yes, your tracking tool does track local SERP. And then 35% said, I don't know. So it's probably good you're in this webinar so you can figure out um, better tracking for local results. And back to you, Lauren. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so now that we've looked at uh, the way that Google uh, ranks differently in different uh, geo areas, again, not Google local, but the main Google results, um, I'm going to look at some uh, or share with you some proven tactics that have uh, worked uh, with some of the sites I've worked on and some of the sites that, that I know have, uh, have implemented um, these tactics across the board. So number one is local page content. Uh, and those can be city guides or city pages. Um, uh, geographic hierarchy structure to your, uh, basically to, to your, the links and uh, the ability for Google to crawl uh, geo-specific parts of your site. Um, implementing a nested URL structure uh, within that hierarchy. And then uh, building local citations, which really means local links. Citations is just a fancy word most of the time for links. Um, and also uh, content and uh, getting that content in front of local influencers who will link to you, share your content, and, and really just build authority at the end of the day. So here are some quick uh, technical SEO um, uh, changes uh, that you can implement in your site that you may not have already. Uh, first of all, here are two examples, one being from a dating site and one being from uh, an apartment um, uh, classified marketplace. And what you'll see here is that uh, they have built what I refer to as a geographical hierarchy um, in terms of their link structure or their directory structure on their site. Um, basically, to an extent, this gives you the ability to kind of control the way Google is, is crawling um, that first step from the home page and making sure that they're, they're first hitting the most important cities that you're competing in um, uh, on your site. And uh, you can also, you know, kind of pair this up a little bit with, with sitemaps or whatnot, but really giving Google that, hey, these are the most important pages on your site in the same way that you would with any navigational structure, but making sure that these pages are targeted towards specific cities. And again, one thing I really want to hit here is that uh, neither one of these uh, examples are for uh, companies that have a local presence. Uh, they're both uh, virtual only, so to speak. Uh, the second tip really is uh, complementing that, uh, that geographical uh, link structure with the way that you're building out your URLs and your breadcrumb, um, breadcrumbs on your site. So uh, for this dating example, um, we see that for their LA page, um, it's marked Los Angeles and their URL slug, Los Angeles in California in the US. And if I were to hit backspace on all of these, I would see that all these directories actually work, which is something that's very important because a lot of the time we'll see a URL structure that may say US and then you go to whatever.com slash US and it's just a blank page or a page that may not exist because it's only a directory file. So really make sure that when you're putting together your URL slugs, that all the different directory files in terms of like, you know, words in between slashes actually work and propagate a page. This really shows Google how you're setting up your site and helps them classify your localized pages um, dramatically. Same thing with Airbnb. So this is an Airbnb listing for Santa Monica. Um, so Santa Monica is nested within Los Angeles with is nested within their locations page. And again, two virtual companies. Airbnb may rent rooms and houses, but they do not have a local presence. And both of these companies are competing dramatically within localized results. Um, another step, if you do have brick and mortar, is to implement uh, schema.org um, rich data into your site. So schema gives you the example, or gives you the opportunity basically to uh, put together a schema uh, snippet with all of your address information, whether you're a branch, whether what part of the company you're, um, uh, you're a franchise of, your phone number, your hours, and all that rich information that really Google wants to be able to get that through a command rather than have the bot scan your site looking for that data. That data, if you can, if you can put it on your site and make it, I mean, this is 
Google Panda in a nutshell. If that data is, is easily accessible and Google doesn't have to scour your site to find it, um, you're probably going to do a little bit better in the results. So let's get to our last poll question, Kelsey. Sure. Let me pull it up here. So our last question is, does your competition change based on where people are searching from? Yes, no, I don't know. So I'm launching that now, and as you guys are answering, I want to remind you that after Lauren's presentation, we're going to have a 20-minute Q&A session about his presentation or anything you want to ask relevant to what he's talking about today. If you are in the GoToWebinar control panel for this webinar, you click on the Questions tab, and it allows you to ask a question. So we are going to be answering those. Um, there's also, some of you might see there is also a surprise Easter egg answer for this poll. Uh, Lauren is the best webinar presenter ever. So let's see if we can get higher participation on this question now. Well, that's, that answer is not embarrassing at all. <laughs> Just got to keep everyone on their toes. Okay, so I'm going to close it. And if you see results, unfortunately, Lauren, you're not the best webinar <laughs> presenter. I'm sorry, but the competition does change based on where people search, so that is good. So Lauren, I'm gonna hide these results and get back to your presentation. Yeah, and actually, you know, the, uh, the answer to this poll is quite interesting because the majority of you said that yes, your competition does change on a geo by geo, state by state, town by town basis but um, it was only 30-odd percent that are actually tracking um, that and getting an idea of who your competition is in each area. So I would definitely see that as an opportunity uh, with building out your, your, uh, your SEO strategy. So let's move forward. Okay, so building unique content and having that content on your site from a content perspective is a great way to compete whether you are a brick and mortar or you are virtual. So here's an example again from this dating site on.com. It's a selfie dating site. Um, but uh, anyway, what they've done here on their LA page that you saw earlier in the nested URL results, they've put together an H1, meet people in Los Angeles, the city of angels, with lots of rich information about LA and not only about dating or meeting people. But it's very unique. It's talking about neighborhoods. It's talking about areas in LA. It's talking about interests in LA. So, for example, if you're searching for, hey, I want to meet someone that loves the uh, the Clippers or whatever, um, you may find this. And it, it's great information. And whether you are a real estate site, um, whether you are a dating classified site, um, some e-commerce that uh, may have uh, uh, stores in each area. Actually, you know, there's so many sites that do not add unique content to those local pages. Google is asking you for that. They want it. Um, so please uh, uh, add that to your overall SVO content strategy. And one great example of a company that's done this, again, is Airbnb. Airbnb rolled out their neighborhoods initiative about a year and a half ago. And basically what they did was instead of writing about like renting a house or renting a room in different uh, locations, they uh, wrote about what people do and what you can do. So shopping, nightlife, um, dining in different locations and hired uh, local guides and local photographers to take pictures. So it, uh, they scaled this out across some of their most uh, popular um, de neighborhoods. And the cool thing about this is, as you see from a keyword ranking perspective, is that they're actually ranking for Echo Park, Echo Park Los Angeles, Echo Park LA, Echo Park Bars, in some cases above the fold or on the front page. So uh, great job there. And it just goes to show that good content that's engageable really works. Okay. So here are some ways to build uh, to build those links um, with geo signals to help you out. When I'm looking at a site that's competing locally and having well really having a difficult time competing locally, one of the first things I look at are the way that their social profiles have been built out across Yelp, Foursquare, Google Plus, and Facebook. You know, all of these uh, all of these profiles give you the ability to link directly to your site. But what I've found is a lot of the time that link goes to the home page of the site, which is really bad from a user experience if someone lands on that Facebook or Foursquare profile and then clicks over. But also, um, it helps from an SEO perspective, um, not only getting that link and getting tra targeted traffic, but when Google serves a result on the mobile phone, when you search for a branded query, whether it be Atlas Chiropractic or you know Concord University or whatever it may be, McDonald's, 
Google's going to serve a hybrid version of, of their local knowledge graph that has um, the map, information on, on the location, and then three calls to action. And they're going to serve this above the traditional results, right? So that call is basically the phone number that's on your Google Plus page, directions to your, you know, your address. But the website button links directly to the link that's on your Google Plus. And that is what you want that website button to be driving traffic back to your location page and not to your home page, where then people are forced to look for that location again. Um, another way I like to build local links is using a tool called WhiteSpark, which identifies um, local resources by the keyword query. So keyword uh, hamburgers in LA, right? So you search for that, and it gives you all of the different um, all of the uh, different yellow page and local business directory type sites, and lets you uh, rank them based upon their authority and uh, submit directly through their tool, which can really save time, especially uh, you know if you're a smaller business or if you're a larger franchise. And again, this is only available to bricks and mortars. It's one advantage they do have. Um, but getting those local citations and local links in, whether you're a brick and mortar or if you're a virtual uh, company, helps you compete. And if you're a virtual company, one way that you can really put together a competitive strategy, and we saw this previously with BuzzFeed and some other content pages, whether they be blog posts or whatnot, that are ranking very high in the results for high traffic terms uh, locally, uh, is putting together content that's relevant um, to influencers in that area. So here's a, here are two examples that a, uh, a beauty school did um, in Texas. Uh, one uh, to the left being a, uh, it's called ego bait, right? You uh, basically list out top bloggers, 50 top internet marketing bloggers, uh, 60 bloggers who would change your life. And in this case, it's um, I think it's 10 uh, beauty bloggers in Texas that you should be following right now. And uh, all of those um, uh, bloggers are listed out with information about their blog, and then they performed an outreach campaign to those bloggers to let them know, hey, we've listed you as a top beauty blogger. Those beauty bloggers find it and then link back, sending in local signals. Another good way to do this, an example is uh, here is a, an infographic that you can basically uh, change the format uh, and make it relevant to almost any uh, any area or geolocation in the U.S. This one is Beauty Careers in Texas, has all kinds of great data on Beauty Careers in Texas, and this was utilized to reach out to the bloggers that were listed uh, to the left and to other influential bloggers in the state of Texas to get those local signals into this website. Um, a great way to find uh, local influencers is, uh, you know, this may sound corny, but the first step is to go to Google and search for, hey, top beauty blogs in California top law blogs in Texas, top fashion blogs in New York. Why? This will give you the first level of some of the most influential sites out there. All right, so add these to your outreach campaign, especially if they're active. Um, but again, like I said, the, the first level. I really like to di dig into the second level of influencers behind these sites. So what I did was, using Majestic SEO, I uh, took the uh, top listed beauty blog in California and ran a backlink check on it. What I found was there are uh, a number of highly influential and active uh, beauty blogs that are linking to mybeautybunny.com, right? And if they're linking to My Beauty Bunny, it basically means that they are open to linking out, you know? So what I did was I pulled this list and I didn't stop there. One thing I really like about Majestic SEO is it gives you the ability to map and bring in geo data on the sites that are in your backlink portfolio. So as you see here, when I pulled this data in a report, I have information on which of these blogs are in California, which of these blogs are in Arizona, which of these blogs are in Houston, Texas. And I can pull that data. So if I'm working with, say, a franchise that has locations in Arizona, California, and Texas, I can reach out to all these blogs with different messaging and ask them to maybe link to different posts, like, hey, top uh, whatever um, bloggers in Arizona, top, you know, to 10 ways to do this in Texas. And really getting in that local, those local links is what's helping a company like BuzzFeed rank um, above the fold and compete with uh, Match.com and um, OkCupid. And as you see, Majestic maps this out. So those are, uh, those are a lot of the tactics that I've utilized in the past, and they are proven tactics to help to rank and, and, and against your competition on a localized level. Uh, in Google 
And uh, you know, now we're going to open up to Q and A. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lauren. You know, I think my favorite part of your presentation is hearing you say "my beauty bunny." <laughs> just, oh yeah, it's mine too. <laughs> you saying "my beauty bunny" is just hilarious to me. So um, anyway, now we're going to have some Q and A. Um, and just a reminder, you can ask that in the questions tab on the GoToWebinar panel. And if you have questions afterward, too, we're live tweeting now. Uh, Debbie, our social media manager, is doing that on our Twitter account, at SE Journal. And then uh, use the hashtag SEJ Think Tank to ask any questions as well. We'd really appreciate it. So that being said, here we go with questions. So Joseph Craig is asking, what's better, schema tagging or adding a location tag? Um, you know, I would really look at both to cover those bases. Um, whatever data you can give directly to the bot as they're crawling is going to be helpful. Also, just make sure that that address is on your site as well. Um, you know, with Google Plus Local, they give you the ability to manually um, upload all of that information. But, um, you know, there's only, with manual upload, there can be errors. And, um, you know, for the most part, I would say just really cover all bases by uh, either the location tag or schema and making sure that all of your local profiles have updated address information. Because, first of all, you don't want someone driving to the wrong place, right? And this happens a lot, actually. I've worked with the stores and franchises that have moved locations, and sometimes changing those locations across the board can be um, can be a struggle because um, you're looking up old profiles and things like that. So I would say that uh, also uh, make sure that um, your company's information is in some of the uh, the top uh, geographical databases out there. I think Oxium's one and um, some others, and we can send them out afterwards too. Okay, great. Um, Adam, Adam, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher your last name. Adam, <laughs> Grace. Greshawak is asking, could a nested geo hierarchy or geo URL structure also impact the visibility of other internal content pages, like informational pages or blog posts? Absolutely. So <clears throat> whenever you're setting up a blog post, um, uh, you know, there's, you can geotag your blog posts or whatever, but um, Having that structure makes sense, especially if, if, you're, if you're targeting locally or if you have localized categories. What I would say if you're setting up a URL um, structure in a blog post, one of, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see is uh, WordPress by default uses a slash category, slash, and then has the name of the category, and you can actually take that slug out because what you don't want to do when you're nesting is have unneeded, um, unneeded uh, directories or, or whatever within your URL structure. Um, also, you know, if, if you're setting up uh, uh, nested or, or, or location pages on your site and, and you are publishing uh, content that's specific to those locations, um, you might want to look into, say, if you have California slash Los Angeles slash articles or California slash Los Angeles slash guides. Um, as well. I know with the, uh, the Airbnb neighborhood examples, a lot of uh, their local information and guides and articles are within those local pages and not necessarily on a centralized blog. Um, now what I would say though is that you're going to want to test probably and you know if you have a blog on your site that already is attracting a lot of links and a lot of authority um, and a lot of social interaction. That may be the first place to put an article, but then you can al always um, set that up within a local page and canonical that article over, sending that value internally, or maybe even do a 301. But there's all kinds of opportunities with um, with setting up content. But if if your existing blog does have a lot of traction, I would say probably start there first, and then try to shoot that equity over, whether it's through an inter internal link or setting up that article later within a geo page and canonicaling that value over. Okay, cool. Um, so Keith Sadler, sorry Keith, I'm bad at math, last names. Um, he is frustrated about what Google chose for 
the, in the, to display in the knowledge graph. So his question was, an important search term for me results in a knowledge graph defining the term. However, the knowledge graph pulls the definition from a competitor's web, website. How can I increase the chance of Google using my site's definition for the knowledge graph? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because <clears throat> I've seen uh, Larry Kim from WordStream share examples of them appearing in the knowledge graph a lot and um, other sites appearing in the knowledge graph a lot. I don't know if there's a step-by-step -step way to get yourself into the knowledge graph, but definitely um, <clears throat> uh, you know, authoritative citations. Um, you know, WordStream being in the knowledge graph is a direct result of the content marketing that they've done over the years. Um, and sometimes, um, sometimes Google will identify what they believe is a very authoritative, authoritative article or page in the in-depth articles section of um, rankings. And um, later you may see one of those appear in the knowledge graph because theoretically they're, they're testing behavior and what people are choosing to select as being in-depth and pulling that in. Um, <clears throat> make sure that you have a Wikipedia page set up and Google recently closed down, or they, they're in the process of closing um, Freebase, which um, was a Wikipedia uh, competitor acquisition they made previously. But, um, <clears throat> you know, thanks for asking that question. I don't have the exact answer for you, but we can definitely look it up and put it in a future SEJ post. Okay, yeah, cool. Uh, so we have a question from Twitter. Drew Davis is asking, how do you target a regional audience like the term Gulf Coast? Oh, um, well, <clears throat> it it really matters. Um, it really matters on what kind of uh, first of all, if you're putting together like something like Gulf Coast vacations or Gulf Coast rentals or or, or, or Gulf Coast whatever it may be, um, that's that's a popular term, and the Gulf Coast can be anywhere from Galveston, Texas, down to, you know, the, the Gulf Coast of Florida. So Panama City, whatever. So what I would say is <clears throat> if, if, Gulf, if Gulf Coast queries in your specific niche are more popular or extremely popular than the uh, location-based queries, or if a lot of those location-based queries are like Gulf Coast of Florida, Gulf Coast of Texas, I would set up a... Um, I would look into setting up a, a main page that's Gulf Coast, right? And then underneath that page, so that would be like your first slash URL in, in the structure or the, the breadcrumb. And then from there, have the selection look into Florida Gulf Coast, um, Texas Gulf Coast, uh, Louisiana Gulf Coast. And then from each of those locations within Florida Gulf Coast, you have like um, Pensacola vacations, uh, Panama City vacations, Clearwater vacations. So essentially you're setting up a total guide to a regional area like the Gulf Coast and then you have the ability to drill down within locations there which should support the overall theme of that being a Gulf Coast section of your page. Um, and uh, I think in, in one of the um, one of the uh, link examples, the apartment company had like southwest region, um, northwest region, northeast region, or for example, like New England would be something that would be mm -hmm. relevant too, because New England takes up multiple states. So, um, you know, that kind of structure um, should uh, work and be effective, and then also like really like look into what your competitors are doing. And what I like about that kind of structure that I just made up on the fly is that uh, <laughs> it would uh, it, it would address um, geo slash regional queries, right? So hotels in the uh, Gulf Coast uh, areas in Florida, or hotels in the Florida Gulf Coast, or whatever it may be. So yeah, definitely look into that. It sounds like too that it's important for you to know how your target audience is searching. If you know they're searching for Gulf Coast or some type of regional term then you should definitely include that in your strategy. 
Yeah, and you can pull that information from external tools, but one thing I would really look at, especially if you're utilizing Google custom search engine on your site, is looking at how your internal queries are, are going. Because if you have an existing Gulf Coast page that's bringing in users, and then from there they're searching for Florida Gulf Coast, um, Texas Gulf Coast, or uh, uh, Clearwater Hotels, or whatever, um, that will identify that user behavior on-site to pair up with off-site and then kind of put that together for your overall strategy. And the great thing then is that you can pull in reviews for each of those locations, blog posts about each of those locations, and really make it a an online resource. Yeah, that's great. So another question from Rich Robinson. He wants to know what you think about Moz Local, which is a tool I've used before and I really like it. Have you used it? You know, no, I, uh, I haven't used it myself, but I've looked over it. Um, a lot of the local tools out there, and, um, you know, the reason I named um, <clears throat> WhiteSpark is because it's one I use. Um, but uh, there's, there's a lot out there, um, whether it's uh, Moz Local, whether it's local um, site submits, and uh, whether it's Sweet IQ, and they all have different approaches. Um, you know, Sweet IQ is very... Uh, they're good at identifying local citations, and they also um, they also really get into making sure that your your profiles are all synced, right? Um, <clears throat> WhiteSpark, um, it, it's great at local citations. Like it's 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 a very uh, popular SEO tool. Um, Moz Local and uh, the company that they acquired to build out Moz Local, I can't really remember off the top of my head. But you know, anything from Moz is usually a very good tool. But I would say that. Um, compare across the board. I mean, if Moz is putting out something, chances are going to be good, especially on the local side. That's really kind of where they're going. Um, it seems that that's where they're going, so, you know, check it out. But, you know, I think it would be fair also in the recap of this webinar to put together a list of local tools. And um, what I like about the local tool market is that the more Google is when Google first started rolling out localization, it was really only to large metropolitan areas. We started seeing it um, in Chicago first. We had a, basically a company call us and say, hey, my leads and traffic uh, for Chicago have dropped. And we were like, but you're number one in Google. And they're like, but we're not getting any traffic to our Chicago hmm. landing page. And that's where we started actually at the time calling up people that live there <laughs> and asking them... <laughs> to search uh, for those terms. Um, so as Google has rolled this out to a myriad of terms across multiple locations, it's getting more difficult to compete. And those local citations that the traditional local tools give for what would be considered local search help on the SEO side. Um, and since Moz is an SEO company, at the end of the day, I would say that um, uh, they, they should have a pretty good offering. Yeah, and one thing to note too for the listeners is the Moz Local isn't free. I want to say it's 50 bucks a year, but I've used it a lot. Yeah, yep, exactly. So um, I've used it a lot. It's really easy to use, especially if you're a small business and you're just starting out and don't just don't want to mess with doing it manually, then I would def definitely recommend it. Uh, so on a related note, we have a question from Anthony Jackson. Um, he said his group is just getting started into SEO. Do you have any recommendations for free tools or sites or resources to get started? Well, first off, I would start with searchenginejournal.com. <laughs> exactly. And you've made that decision, and, and you're on the right track. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of tools out there that have free versions that um, up to a certain extent uh, you can utilize or low-cost versions. Um, one of my favorite tools for gauging where your site ranks, and also they do um, some. They have an auditing platform and uh, backlink pulling is SEMrush, which I mentioned before. Um, Raven Tools is uh, also a great tool for uh, performing an on-site uh, site audit and uh, project managing a lot of your uh, basically bringing in Google Webmaster Tools and analytics and external information all in one dashboard to kind of get an overview of how you're doing across SEO and social. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, most tools out there have um, freemium versions. 
So uh, parts of Moz let you do that. Um, I believe SEM Rush and uh, Raven to an extent let you pull some information. So test them out on the front. Test test out the tools that are freemium, and then go from there. Um, <clears throat> the limitations that I see with a lot of free tools um, on the market is, especially the ones that are ad based, is that um, you know they have a <clears throat> they have a specific ceiling that you don't get above. So as your site grows and as SEO as organic SEO revenue grows, you should be able to expand your tool set. And what you don't want to do is start off with one free tool, right? And then have all of this, uh, have budget to be able to pay something and then transfer everything over. So you might want to start freemium and then look at ways to upgrade in the future. Okay, awesome. Uh, Jay McKenzie would like to know, can you add more color on your comment about Google detecting mobile users Entering URLs that they see on a billboard. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I can. Actually, it's a great story. So, uh, about two or three years ago, I had a client that was in the car insurance um, world, and um, the company uh, had done a limited amount of offline advertising, like outdoor or radio, but uh, they focused primarily on online, right? Banners, uh, Facebook, PPC, everything else. So um, they ended up um, they ended up uh, launching an outdoor advertising campaign and TV commercial campaign in Philadelphia, Orlando, and Tampa, Florida. Um, what was very interesting is that, <clears throat> of course, we saw an increase in um, traffic coming from those areas, and this is back. This is back when you could actually track keywords uh, in uh, Google Analytics, but we also saw an increase in traffic for uh, for some of their location pages in those areas. But then when we were looking at the keywords for the traffic increase in those areas, we saw that <clears throat> they were getting, those specific areas were getting more uh, traffic from non-branded terms like car insurance or car insurance quotes or cheap car insurance in those test markets than others. And this was before a lot of these tools rolled out where you could track local, so we did this manually, um, but we started tracking uh, where they were ranking for those generic terms, um, not only in Orlando, Tampa, and Philadelphia, but also places where they weren't doing testing, right? So like Cleveland, Chicago, and, and other major cities. And what we found was that in the areas where they were getting more they're doing more advertising, which led to more type in traffic. That um, type in traffic being their brand name. That they're actually ranking higher for generic terms like um, car insurance and others, ranking higher in those areas than they do where they did not do advertising. So, what we found was that Google preferred they they knew that users in those areas, based upon the increase in type in uh, branded traffic we're looking for that company. And um, again, this is right kind of when localization started to roll out. And since users' intent and, and interest in that area was for that specific company, they started to rank higher for those non-branded terms. Um, and then after that happened, we, we, we saw, similar, um, I saw similar results in, in the financial area with some banks that were doing advertising campaigns that were localized. Um, another company that was actually doing a direct mail campaign for certain states where they could operate in, and um, similar results. So, <clears throat> you know, one thing I would say, especially if you're working with a, you know a larger company that does have its its own um, offline marketing department, advertising department, and stuff like that, is even if you can't get like a keyword or whatever into uh, that material, uh, look at the verb. First of all, get a get a calendar. Right, so you can track those trends in analytics as they happen, and as you see, maybe branded traffic spike up or whatever it may be. But also get a calendar, get the locations, and get the verbiage that you're using, because you may see people searching for a jingle or maybe a message in a commercial or you know whatever it might be. So like for example, for Wendy's, people probably search more for where if if the Wendy's campaign for Where's the Beef happened today, people would search more for Where's the Beef than Wendy's <laughs> restaurants. So, um, but yeah, like uh, the type in traffic for the brand when they did the radio campaign, outdoor advertising campaign, and, and TV campaign 
helped lift the site as a whole from an organic traffic perspective and ranking perspective in those markets. Awesome, that's a great story. Um, before we get to our next question, I want to mention two things. First, uh, two people have crushed my dreams and told me that Moz Local is now $84 a year instead of 50 So just a note if anybody's interested in that. Um, and then also, we're just going to go for a couple more questions, maybe one or two more questions. And we will have all your questions after the webinar, and we're going to try to answer them on Twitter on the hashtag SCJ Think Tank. And if you've asked anything on that hashtag as well, Lauren and I and Debbie and Danielle and the rest of the team will be looking at that afterwards. And the YouTube recording of this will be available in a couple days. Um, since you guys registered, you will get a personalized email from Danielle with that link. And then also the slides will be on SlideShare. So one of our last questions, Mitch McDonald wants to know, and this is a question I get asked a lot with clients, so it's really good. Um, besides cleaning your browser and searching from incognito slash private windows, do you have any tips for showing clients a non-biased SERP just so they know how they truly rank? A lot I ask because a lot of prospects in my region think they rank number one already, but they really don't. Right. Um, <clears throat> there is a... Um... There is a browser that was put out by a company called White Hat Security that is a version of Chrome's open source that blocks everything. It blocks all cookies, it blocks all tracking, it blocks everything out there. Um, I can send that out afterwards. I need to do a little bit of research on the name of that browser or because uh, my computer is set to the presentation mode. Um, but um, uh, that would be a good way. Um, you know, really, another good way besides incognito mode is to show them um, some of the results from some of the tools I, I showed you previously. Um, and I recently worked with a company that, uh, you know, they, they, they believe that they ranked on the first page for a lot of their terms, and they really wanted to know why um, <clears throat> why those, uh, those terms uh, were not bringing in traffic. And the fact was is that, yeah, first of all, they were searching from their own computers and they're probably on their site all day. Um, so I feel sorry for them from a retargeting perspective as well because they're probably getting ads for their own company all day. Um, but uh, secondly, um, they were ranking higher in their area because all of their local signals, all of their signals were pointing to their headquarters. And in all of the satellite offices and locations, they had not set up really anything pointing equity um, to those uh, places. You, you see this a lot, actually. Um, there are a number of fast food chains, uh, McDonald's, for example, that um, their location pages are for their their websites for all of their uh, restaurants are on an entirely different website and have. have which has almost zero inbound equity. Um, they're not under the McDonald's.com site, which is really interesting. Um, you see this a lot with car dealerships as well, um, where uh, you know things may be the uh, the main uh, company may be running things from a branding perspective, but regional uh, companies uh, uh, are up to doing the marketing on their own. So it, you see a huge differentiation across the board. Um, but yeah, I will look at the white um, uh, the white hat security browser and send that over because it is a great browser for pulling almost anything, and it blocks it blocks everything across the board, right? And incognito mode still has some personalization, um, and um, yeah, so that that's a great way. But I would say that uh, you know the example I showed earlier from SEM Rush does pull a snapshot of the SERPs themselves. And um, that's a great way to show them too, because you can be like, "Look, you know, this is where you are in Dallas. This is where you are in Chicago. This is where you are in New York. You're not competing. Here are the steps to get there. Let's move forward." Type thing. Okay, awesome. And I gave the link to the White Hat Aviator web browser in case anyone wants to check it out Thank you. on their own. I put that in chat. So our last question, and this is something I actually have gotten asked before as well um, from Ben. Does the geolocation of the host, so the server that your website is hosted on, does that affect your search results? 
Yeah, it um, it can more so internationally than regionally, um, but uh, to an extent it can. Um, also, some of the information from a tool like Majestic may be based upon where their server is. Typically, you see a mix of that. Um, but you know, what I would say is that it, it, it's it's not a it's not a very large component. Um, now, signals from sites or companies that are in your area are much more important, you know, but the fact of the matter also is, is that almost any hosting company runs off of a couple of major hosts that are typically based in Reston, Virginia, um, or near Silicon Valley, or somewhere in the Midwest. So, um, you know, it's, I think at the end of the day, Google realizes that. Um, and uh, it's not a huge component, but internationally it is huge. Internationally it is huge. Like I was even talking to some of the people at Baidu um, about a client of mine that was setting up a, a site for uh, for China, for the Chinese market, and um, their recommendation was that uh, the American company um, work with a host that's based in Hong Kong and not in mainland China, and um, set up their Chinese site on a subdomain. So basically, C name it over to the other international hosting company because uh, the value of that main subdomain or the main domain kind of brings up the uh, the page on the subdomain as well. So it's it's a huge component um, internationally, uh, but regionally in the U.S. not so much. Okay, awesome. So. I think we have to wrap up now. Lauren, thank you so much for answering all these questions. And I know, guys, there's a lot more questions. These will be saved, so we're going to try to get to them as soon as we can. Um, just make sure you monitor the SCJ Think Tank uh, hashtag on Twitter. And before we go, I just want to tell everyone our next webinar is actually a site audit. So we're going to have people from our audience submit sites that they want some of the SEJ team to look at live. And uh, we'll pick those three, and then we'll also have one done live from the audience. And that's going to be March 4th at 1 PM Eastern. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, we will send out a link to sign up for that webinar. And with the site audit, all the experts are on video. So it's a really cool way to get uh, personalized advice for your site if you need help. So again, thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to connect. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Bye, everyone.